Thank you very much. Good morning. And thank you to Mary and Bill and uh, Jason and all the organizers. It is, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that uh, all the work that I'm going to present is done in uh, collaboration with my long-term collaborator, Giulio Tononi, now uh, over the last uh, 17 years, actually, in Madison, Wisconsin. And the work is funded by NIMH and NINDS. So of course, we are trying to solve the riddle of why we need uh, to sleep and why we think actually sleep is very important and essential. Uh, and to do so, we have always started from the very same definition of sleep, which is not uh, that of not moving, is uh, the feature that distinguishes really sleep from wake uh, is partial sensory disconnection. So when we are asleep, uh, we lose partially the ability to respond to a situation that could be even uh, fatal. And so uh, you can have any idea about what to sleep is for, but I think uh, that idea has to account for this feature. Because if you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, all the uh, animal species that have been studied so far, carefully at least, uh, do sleep. And so from an evolutionary standpoint, that make, makes no sense if whatever the function of sleep is, it could be done during wake in a condition that is much less uh, dangerous. So going, the brain being offline and therefore we losing the ability to respond promptly to a stimulus uh, must be something really critical for that function or that uh, process or functions. And we think that function is the synaptic uh, homeostasis, uh, which is of course a very important function. With the, we have many synapses in the brain most, uh, almost all of what I'm going to tell you about uh, refers to the excitatory glutamatergic synapses that are the majority, 80% or so, of all synapses in, uh, uh, in the brain. And they really look like this. So that's what I'm going to tell you about, the presynaptic component, the axonal button, and then this uh, protrusion of the dendritic shaft that is the, the spine. Uh, we know that uh, synaptic activity accounts for the bulk of the brain's energy budget. There are uh, disagreements about the specific percent, but they all agree that uh, really the total amount of energy required to maintain the ionic balance and to sustain firing is at least 60 to 70 to 80 percent of the total amount of energy used in, uh, in the brain. Now, this idea, this uh, synaptic homeostasis hypothesis, is, is very simple. Uh, and is uh, that uh, when we are awake, uh, we are always learning something new. Because by definition, learning means that you adapt your connections, your synapses, uh, to an ever-changing environment. So you are m constantly modifying them. <coughs> And uh, although certainly there are forms of learning that are mediated by synaptic depression, the vast majority of forms of learning are mediated by potentiation. And that's why we think that at the end of the waking day, you end up in the left side of this um, graph with a net increase in synaptic strength in many brain circuits, which is what is shown in these red lines in many of the brain areas. And at the cellular, at the synaptic level, that means that your synapses are stronger. They have, for instance, more AMPA receptors. And we think that that calls for a need for renormalization. And that weakening renormalization has to happen during sleep, exactly because when we are asleep, we are, the brain is uh, offline. And this process ends up by producing a very uh, widespread uh, weakening of many circuits. And uh, at the cellular level, you end up with a weaker, leaner, and more efficient, more efficient uh, synapses. So that's the general idea. I want to uh, really stress this fact that if for this idea to be correct, it has to be true that there is a net imbalance, that by the end of the major waking period, you have to have a net increase in synaptic strength in many circuits, not just in one. I would argue that uh, if this is true only in a specific small region of the brain, then that's not the function of sleep. 
and then you have a net decrease during, uh, during sleep. Now, I don't have the time to go through all the points of the, the rationale for this hypothesis because I want to show you today mainly unpublished data. But these are the main points that I just uh, stated. That we learn mainly during wake and is mainly through potentiation and then we need to renormalize. And we think the renormalization has to happen mainly during sleep. And actually we think that is exactly this process of renormalization that uh, uh, then is able to account for all the benefits of sleep at the cellular level and at the systems level. Uh, the, ma the major, the first points I think are not controversial at all, that we learn mainly by potentiation and that then we really need uh, renormalization. There are studies by in decades of studies with uh, um, you know, implementing rules of learning in uh, computers, in uh, neural network. And when you do so, you immediately uh, realize that you need to implement rules for uh, weakening and depression. Otherwise, you saturate synapses and you go into runaway potentiation. But I think in the, in the field in general, people think that the brain is... Um, smart enough to be able to do, to maintain this balance of total synaptic weight uh, more or less at any given time. So that uh, you, if you now, hopefully, because you are listening to me, you are potentiating some circuit, simultaneously you are renormalizing and weakening other synapses to maintain the balance. And I think that's not instead what's happening. It's also very inefficient. Uh, and uh, not very clever, frankly, because that would mean that you have to already forget what Vlad or Giorgio told you, uh, or Nick, because you need to balance at any given time. And so the, the general idea really is that yes, there is a balance, but the balance is not at any given time, every minute, every, every hour, is across the 24 hours. Maybe it's even longer than 24 hours. We don't know, but at the very least, it must be 24 hours. So it must be, again, that there is a perfect time to learn and to increase, to produce a net increase in synaptic strength. And that's during wake, when yesterday I was here for, you know, the brain is poised to lay down a lot of traces, a lot of memories related to the experience, even if you don't want to related to me coming to London yesterday, the neuromodulatory milieu when I'm awake is all promoting synaptic potentiation. There are high levels of uh, noradrenaline, norexin, histamine, acetylcholine, BDNF. They are all promoting uh, potentiations rather than uh, depression. And then there is a time, instead, a perfect time for the renormalization, and that's during sleep, when, again, the neuromodulatory milieu is instead conducive to depression. And uh, crucially, I am not a slave of the here and now of the environment, yet uh, all my neurons more or less are active. That's what we have learned uh, in the last century. Neurons do not shut off during sleep. They are more or less simultaneously active, which is actually the perfect uh, way for the brain to sample in a comprehensive way all the synaptic strength and produce what we call now a smart uh, synaptic uh, down selection. Because if you think about this process of renormalization as to be able to account not just that the next day we are able to learn a new thing, so we have avoided the saturation, but we have been able to consolidate memories, but we have also been able to integrate the newly formed memories with the, our body, of our schema of knowledge. So there is a process of uh, gist extraction. We have forgotten many things, which is, by the way, as important as remembering. So it's a very complex process. And so it requires a, a very smart process of renormalization. Uh, again, with benefits at the cellular as well as at the uh, system level, at the cellular level, Clearly, 
if synapses are uh, weaker, they use less energy and supplies and they are far away from saturation. Now you can say, well, yes, but how is exactly that this smart down selection can occur? That seems quite complicated and indeed it is complicated, but I think in the last uh, two years or so, there have been several studies uh, that I only have really time to briefly mention um, from other labs that have been testing these hypotheses, and these have frankly been extremely flattering, uh, testing the hypothesis with their own uh, expertise and really trying to understand how this process could, uh, could in fact happen. So here are only my three points to stress the, the take-home message. First of all, now we know that in fact the fact that neurons are active during sleep is crucial, is essential for this process uh, of renormalization to, to happen. And so the fact that neurons are firing during the upstate of the slow oscillations, so the fact that there is a high activity during sharp wave ripple in the hippocampus, that's key. And optogenetically, if you block those, uh, those activities, you actually block the process of renormalization and downscaling of firing or downscaling of uh, synaptic weights. The other crucial thing is that what you do during waking is crucial, and we go back to what also Vlad presented, um, to dictate whether or not these synapses will be subjected to this weakening or instead protected, or perhaps even actually potentiated. We don't know that, but at the very least protected. And the results that we have known for quite a long time is that if you use neurons a lot during your wake period, these neurons are, more po are poised to be more active at the beginning of sleep, uh, the reactivation process. And because of that, uh, is um, easier for those synapses uh, to to be active in a way that is uh, STDP dependent pre following uh, preceding post and being protected by the slit, by, by the renormalization. This is this is studies, especially from um, Ole Paulsen and Ed Mann here in, in the UK, I think suggest very strongly that there could be very specific rules that apply to the slow wave activity that could explain exactly how this process can happen. And also uh, at the molecular level, we know some candidates, omer one a being one of them, that um, are the nice candidates for the tagging of uh, synapses um, for the down selection or, or not. Now, the, 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 the hypothesis is simple and is testable. It's not so trivial to measure, actually, synaptic strength, and that's why, at least for us, it's, it's taking 20 years to really test it, uh, because you have to use many models and many methods. Many models also because um, if this is a very important function of sleep, it has to be true, at least that would be my opinion, it has to be true across the species. It cannot only be true in humans or in a mouse, it has to be true in a fly also in a zebrafish. So, you know, we have used many uh, markers. I very briefly go through this because it's published. For instance, at the molecular level, classically in mammals, you can measure the expression of uh, AMPA receptors, the total amount of uh, their expression or their phosphorylation levels. And on the left, that's a study that uh, Vlad did when he was working with, uh, with us. And uh, in that, in that es experiment, we took uh, an entire, just half of the cortex of a rat, or an entire uh, hippocampal formation, and then through extraction and enrichment for synaptic protein through uh, synaptoneurosomes, then we Western blot, we measure the total amount of AMPA receptor, gluer one containing especially, and phosphorylation levels. And all these bars, uh, they're giving the same result, basically that the expression of these markers uh, is 20 to 30 to 40 percent higher after wake, during the night or sleep deprivation, short deprivation during the day, doesn't matter, relative to uh, sleep. And again, what is important here is we are taking a chunk, a big portion of the brain and measuring the overall expression of this receptor. On the right, this is a, mo a more recent study done by Rick Ugenir's lab 
they did it in mice and they extracted actually the postsynaptic densities from the entire mouse forebrain and they basically get the same results. The, 100, the dashed line 100 for them is the wake level and then you see that we sleep uh, many uh, the expression of many of these receptors go, goes down by 20 30 percent so i think at the molecular level if you use this as a marker of synaptic strength the results are very consistent across uh, labs species and again when you look uh, where it counts uh, that is in the synapses now, of course, you can use electrophysiology and measure the amplitude of the vocal responses. Many studies have been done with this method in mice, in rats, and in people. This specific uh, diagram refers to humans in which the cortical response is measured by uh, TMS. And uh, the point is that by staying awake longer and longer, the slope and the amplitude of the evoke responses in, in increases. The, the pink line here is one night of sleep deprivation, and then after the blue line is the one uh, recovery sleep, and then it goes down. Now, evoke responses are uh, indirect evidence, I believe. Uh, there is is consistent with the idea that uh, there could be an increase in synaptic strength, but it could very well be also that there is a change in intrinsic excitability of neurons. So, so that's why we never take the evoke responses alone as the uh, definitive proof. But one point that I want to mention in many of these studies, now there are at least probably six, seven across the labs. If you try when you are there at the top after several hours of extended wake to induce plasticity in a, in a uh, rat as Vlad did by electrical cortical stimulation trying to induce a LTP or in people by forcing them to learn a new motor task, you have very hard time to do that. Suggesting that at least in cortex, uh, the synapses are not that far from saturation, actually. So it doesn't take, because again, this is one night of sleep deprivation in people. So it's not an extreme condition. And yet you can get uh, this issue that it becomes quickly more difficult to learn. Now, recently we thought that perhaps uh, the most stringent way of testing this idea was through electromicroscopy. The simple reason being that fortunately there is a very strong correlation between structural and functional plasticity. So if it's true the synapses get stronger with wake and then they weaken with sleep, it should really literally be true that they grow in size after a few hours of uh, wake and then they shrink with sleep. So we have a serial block phase electron microscope in, in the lab that we literally use day and night and um, it works very well. This is, um, these are stacks of images taken from the mouse primary motor cortex or primary sensory cortex. So the results that I'm going to show you uh, are pulled actually because the results are exactly the same. This is layer two, superficial layers. The technique is fantastic. You can get these stacks uh, um, in one day or overnight. The little detail, little problem is that still then to reconstruct these nice uh, pieces of dendrites, we try to be unbiased and to reconstruct all the spiny, uh, again, excitatory synapses in, in the block. You still have to do it manually. So it's extremely time consuming. We reconstruct the branches and then the axon. And what we are really interested in is the red area. So the direct area of contact between the axonal button and the um, synaptic, the, the spine, the postsynaptic component, because that's one of the most direct structural measures of synaptic strength. You can actually use uh, what you want. We use the red line the axon spine interface, you could use the postsynaptic density, you can use this, the volume of the spine, we did that too. They are all very strongly positive correlated to each other, as shown here. And of course, most importantly, it has been shown, that's why we are using them, that the, all these measures are strongly correlated with functional measures, for instance, with the expression of the AMPA receptors or the uh, functional currents mediated by these receptors. So um, these are our conditions, so we always use the animals, the mice here that are killed in the middle of the afternoon, so after several hours, six, seven hours of sleep, they spend at least 70% of that time asleep. Here what you see 
is the wake period in the last uh, six hours for these groups. And then we compare it with spontaneous awake animals that are killed in the middle of, uh, of the night. But um, of course, if you do so, you, you have potentially a huge confounding factor due to sleep uh, to circadian time. And that's why we also use extended wake or sleep deprivation because these animals are killed at the same time of day as the sleeping animals, but they are kept awake by novel objects. And novel objects, uh, going back to the question before, is because we try to mimic what is real life in which we go out in the world and we are le always learning something new. So when I say sleep versus wake, I mean versus both wake conditions. So we can com control for time of day as well as with any kind of stress related to uh, the stimulation. So time consuming, just to be precise, means these are all the dendrites that we reconstructed. And at the end was 7,000 synapses or so across animals. And this is five years, five people working full time. So we hope sooner or later we will get to deep learning good enough to do automatic segmentation. But we, uh, to my knowledge, <laughs> we are still not there. So here is the result. So each dot here is one of these axon spine interface, these structural measures. The blue is the sleep group. And you see, I hope you appreciate the, the overall population is uh, the uh, average size is decreased relative to the two waking conditions that look surprisingly similar to um, each other. So on, on average, it's a 18% decrease in size of the uh, axon spine interface after sleep relative to both wake condition. And uh, it, this is expected if you plot the data here on a linear scale, uh, is log normal. So it was known in cortex, uh, which means that, uh, you know, most synapses, as and the four synapses, are small or medium size. There are very few large synapses. You can plot exactly the same data here on a logarithmic scale, and that's how you see better, perhaps, that the uh, blue curve, the sleep curve, is shifted to the left relative to the other two, suggesting scaling. And indeed, you can test and you can show that at least at the population level is scaling. But uh, I hope you see here, there is this component here that is around 20% of the synapses, the largest one, they do not seem to change. So they don't seem to change between sleep and wake. We don't know exactly why. We speculate these are the large mushroom spines, uh, the strongest synapses. They may be already very committed uh, to strong memories, strong events, and they are not very plastic, at least within the, our experimental conditions. So just to mention, when we have these images and stacks, we also very, very easily see around, this is the spine, this is the bouton, these are the peripheral astrocytic processes. And Michele Bellesi uh, in, in the lab was very interested in uh, um, reconstructing also the astrocytic uh, processes and uh, find out uh, how astrocytes uh, change between sleep and wake. This is published, and so I'm not going to show you this, but we see increase in the coverage of the astrocytic processes around the synapse with extended wake. We also see that the phagocytosis of astrocytes increases. They're taking out uh, little pieces, especially, especially of the terminals of the bouton, probably is a process of uh, you know, taking care of the wear and tear of these, especially large synapses. I want briefly to show you this because it's uh, um, just published, is the newest part. We were able to measure the granules of uh, glycogen. Uh, uh, it's actually quite easy to spot them in the astrocytes, uh, count them, and you know, actually measure the, the size. And uh, this is interesting re related to you know, the, the link between sleep need and uh, metabolism. And also because in our field, there has been a very um, influential hypothesis put forward in 95 by uh, Bennington and Heller about the fact that, well, when we wake up, is increased energy. There is depletion, rapid depletion of glycogen, which may start triggering one of the signal for the homeostasis. The, the, the glycogen goes down and vice versa. Adenosine keeps mounting up. And that's one of the signal that the brain gets that um, 
indeed we have been awake and now we need to go to sleep. This was the original hypothesis. Now on the right you see there have been modification, especially by the group of uh, Petit, Pellerin and Magistretti, starting from their, their results that, well, but when you have depletion of glycogen actually, then you trigger all the pathways for the new synthesis of glycogen that are mainly dependent on noradrenaline actually. So there is a strong actually trigger to produce new glycogen when you are awake. So is there really depletion of glycogen uh, with wake or not? And the results so far have been very inconsistent. One of the reasons is that uh, it's extremely difficult to measure glycogen because it gets degraded very rapidly, but also because uh, to the best way supposedly to do so is by killing very rapidly the animal with a microwave, a uh, uh, super powerful microwave oven. Uh, but then you have a chunk of tissue and you grind out the tissue and it's the entire glycogen. While we thought, well, although this is not the gold standard because you still need to perfuse the animal, but we try to be very quick, it's less than 60 seconds. At least here we can look at the granules where we think it counts that is really around the synapses only. And so what we see is the following. If we count the number of granules, we see that the condition that we have is sleep, wake and sleep deprivation, so the three conditions that I uh, mentioned before. We also have uh, five, day of, uh, five days of chronic sleep restriction, quite an extreme condition in which the mice are, uh, can only sleep a third of their sleep for five days. Progressively, we wake the number of granules, the density, so for uh, volume of astrocytes, increases. So from that point of view, actually, it's not depletion. You keep accumulating more glycogen. But if you measure the size, the size of the granules actually progressively decreases with wake. So you have two uh, opposite results, if you wish. But what counts seems that there is a lot of literature, not in the brain, is mainly in liver and muscle, the people do these kind of studies, the, the glycogen is extremely big and complicated uh, molecule with a lot of branching, and it seems that what really counts is the, the size of the granule, because it's only the outer part of the, of the molecule that can very effectively and very rapidly release the glucose residues. So there are formulas that you can apply that will estimate how much glucose is actually really available based on the number of granules, of course, but mainly based on the size. And so when we apply these formulas, we estimated the number of glucose, actually you see that that number decreases with wake. So this evidence would suggest that, in fact, Bennington and Heller were correct in saying that, you know, there is progressively, it's not a total depletion, the glycogen keeps being formed, it is there, but certainly this seems, at least in this condition, that the, the brain is not really able to keep up with the demand, and then progressively you have less and less easily available glucose uh, for uh, synaptic activity. So going back to synapses, and then I, I want to show you in the uh, last part the unpublished data, I'm always asked about inhibitory synapses. Of course, this takes even longer because they are, <laughs> they are fewer. So this is what we have so far, and I can say that so far we have no evidence to see changes in the size, in the three conditions, again, that we have, or in the number of these synapses, in the same stacks, so in the same then drives that we measure, uh, where we measure the excitatory synapses. Now, the last thing that we have done is the hippocampus. So we ask, well, uh, can we see evidence for this uh, renormalization in a different region that is so important for plasticity, learning, and memory? So the three conditions are the same. Actually, most of these animals are literally the same. And uh, the, what we study is the CA3 to CA1 connection. And uh, these are all more than 7,000 synapses. There is an interesting difference that makes the statistics a little bit more difficult, which is that uh, while in cortex there is this log normal distribution, in the CA1 is bimodal. So there is a um, relatively large proportion of large synapses, although these synapses are actually 
in, in linear scale smaller than those in cortex. And uh, so because you have this bimodal, you need to divide the two populations, which has been done and is very well known that the large population has perforated the huge mushroom synapses with discontinuous uh, PSD. These are the results. First of all, first difference in cortex, we never see changes in density number between sleep and wake. In the hippocampus, we do see with sleep deprivation already, there is an increase in the number of synapses uh, in sleep deprivation relative to the two other conditions for the non-perforated, so for the largest, the smaller group of synapses. When we look at the ASI, at the distribution for the per non-perforated, uh, you see a clear increase in uh, a, a shift towards higher values with sleep deprivation. And also if you run an LME model, uh, and so the mean values is also increased. For the perforated, there is already a shift with spontaneous wake. And if you run the model, it's the mean is only different here because uh, you know, it's the distribution that changes, but not the average value. So to summarize, the, in cortex, uh, we see the two wake conditions behave exactly in the same way. And what we see is a decrease by 18% or so in 80% of the synapses, all the small and the medium one. In the hippocampus, is very different. The overall result is the same. So sleep overall brings about a decrease uh, in synapses. But the spontaneous wake and uh, sleep deprivation behave differently. With spontaneous wake, what uh, decreases in sleep versus spontaneous wake is only this group. And instead, in extended wake is both groups and actually even the number changes. I want to show you only one sli last slide about the PAPs. We have always asked, well, maybe, you know, this need for renormalization applies to the relatively mature brain in which, uh, after all, the space is limited, the energy has been already committed, but what about a developing brain? This is as early as we could get, two-week-old pups, because that's where you can um, define sleep behaviorally in a consistent way. These pups are basically as awake or as sleep uh, every 50% of every hour. So when we try to, to do this experiment, we only have two conditions, sleep and sleep deprivation. We, we can't have spontaneous wake at night because they are just not awake that time. The take home message, this is uh, again motor cortex, so cortex layer two, is that uh, in fact, if anything, we see even a larger change between sleep and, and sleep deprivation. So it's a 34% uh, decrease with sleep, and the effect seems to be quite uh, uh, actually widespread across all uh, synapses. Now, be, uh, bear in mind here, even the largest synapses in these animals are half of the size uh, of the more mature uh, animals. So it seems, at least here, that this, this need for renormalization certainly also applies to the developing brain. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'll be selfish and grab the first question. Um, can you speculate about the difference between REM and non-REM? Uh, because this development seems to be implying REM in your shy mechanism? No, no. So first of all, um, we always study total sleep. And my personal opinion, which is uh, opposite to what many other sleep researchers <laughs> have, is that actually sleep is important as a global phenomenon. So I start from the assumption that non-REM and REM do the fundamental same function. So, and why I say that? Because I think what is crucial for this process is uh, to have a neuromodulatory milieu conducive to depression. From that point of view, REM is even better than non-REM. These, in these animals, uh, when you do, I didn't show the, the, in the P13 animals, when they do the sleep deprivation and the sleep rebound, they actually recover much oh, more non-REM than REM. So they are already, is, is as early as we could get, but they are already in a stage in which REM has gone down quite a lot. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Nick? Um, 
I absolutely agree with you that if sleep serves a fu fundamental vital uh, role, that it must be a process that can only happen during sleep. Um, but I've already begun to forget what Giorgio and Vlad actually talked about. And so, and, uh, so obviously, some degree of synaptic downscaling and uh, renormalization happens during waking. So what I'm not clear is what exact qualitative difference there is that you're proposing in these mechanisms can only happen during sleep. Now, I think, well, I would first of all argue that if I probe you, you think you have forgotten, but you probably have laid down a trace of what George and Vlad say. So I don't, I'm not sure I buy your argument that you have already forgotten. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you will it. have to show me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying that because, you know, there are uh, um, precise experiments that have been done exactly to test uh, because people think, well, I can only remember a few things, but actually when you probe and you present people with hundreds of objects, you test them, their accuracy is uh, higher than 90%. So our brain, even if you don't want to remember what they say, is actually pretty good. So, uh, no, I don't think what, what gets, we think based on this, what, what would get protected is what is extremely relevant and salient, and so maybe that was not their case, or what fits with your prior body of knowledge. If what they say resonates, that's another uh, strong predictor that uh, you know, you will reactivate neurons that are already very strongly active in your in your. So those will be the two fundamental features. That, uh, but um, uh, you know, it's very difficult. I, I agree with you. We need to show indeed that this process is not uh, possible in wake uh, at the at the fundamental level or at least to compare it and say, yes, it's possible, but it's so inefficient uh, and has so many side effects that, uh, you know, it's much better in sleep. Okay, one last question. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question about, uh, you know, a third arm of the, of the um, you talked about astrocytes and so forth, but, you know, there's macroglia and now there's more and more interest in uh, the role of complement and some of these molecules in synaptic plasticity. And I'm, I'm just wondering what you think about that and if you have looked at that. We looked at astrocytes, the phagocytosis, and also microglia. Astrocytes, this phagocytosis, gets uh, activated already after six or seven hours of um, sleep deprivation. Microglia, in our hands, only you see activation at the morphological level as well as the functional level. So you see pieces of the terminals inside the microglia in the chronic sleep restriction which again is quite uh, an extreme condition. Uh, but uh, we see sign, but clearly seems that the astrocytes are responding much earlier and it's probably a totally physiological response. And it's not inflammatory, it's just taking read of a yeah. And this complement system, does it work yeah. in uh, both the astrocyte and the It does, microbial? and we have data uh, from, um, um, you know, transcriptomic, the, C, the C1Q gets upregulated by extended wake. Great, thank you very much. So um, I'd like to thank all the speakers in this session. We've had very interesting data. Um, so uh, thank the speakers. <laughs> um, uh,